Welcome uh, to the Leaders Forum. I'm Sharon Oster. Most of you know me. I'm the Dean of uh, the School of Management. And it's my pleasure um, to introduce you to Jeff Bucus. So let me say a few words about Jeff, who feels like he's part of the Yale family. In fact, we make him do so many things for us, I'm pretty sure he's going to be on the payroll uh, one of these days. Some of you met him in the fall when he did orientation for us and um, spent a lot of time with you uh, at Time Warner. He is come, I guess, to Dick Foster's class. Uh, Sonnenfeld seems to think he might get a few minutes from him this afternoon, but I don't know if I'm going to let him go. Uh, and now he's here to do our most distinguished seminar series, the uh, Leaders Forum. Jeff's had a very interesting career after leaving um, Yale and eventually going to get a Stanford MBA. Um, we know him, of course, now as the CEO of Time Warner, where he's been as the CEO since 2008. But many people in the media space actually uh, first caught wind of him and his excellence when he was running HBO. Uh, I may date myself, but I was always a big fan of Sex and the City. And for those of us who were fans of Sex and the City, uh, Jeff uh, was, for many in the media space, thought of as the real Mr. Big. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and as the real Mr. Big actually did a lot in what he did at HBO, really, to transform the way we think about U.S. television and what goes on in, uh, in the U.S. television scene. Um, having done such a good job uh, there, they um, made him take the head job at Time Warner, which, of course, by then had been part of what was often thought of as the worst merger in U.S. history. Um, and part of his job has been to kind of disentangle the place from the sins of his uh, predecessors um, in a time that is amongst the hardest of times for the media business. So I think he's going to have lots of interesting things to tell us about leadership. Uh, please wel help welcome Jeff Bucus. Thank you. Good morning. And Sharon, thanks. I like that idea about going on the payroll. <laughs> But I warn you, if uh, it's the other way around. Yeah, I think it goes the other way around. That's not how it works. <clears throat> so watch out. If you do succeed, don't tell Yale or any other school that you go to. So um, I didn't know two, year, two days ago that I was, uh, had committed, this is a, a confession of disorganization, I had no idea I was supposed to give a talk. Uh, my, my assistant said to me, she called it your lecture, which I thought, holy God, a lecture at Yale? It's a trauma. So <clears throat> I actually cooked up a lecture, but I also understand that I'll try to give you some comments so that we put out some threads of a conversation. And then is it the practice that we have a discussion after that? Okay. Okay, so uh, let's proceed with the lecture. Something that as I sat in the back row of many classrooms at, at Yale College, I thought uh, my classmates would have said, geez, I hope Bucus doesn't give a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. So anyway, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. You know, it's a pretty uh, odd time to be uh, in a room full of people that will even admit that they're MBAs. Because if you think about what's happened out there in the world to the global economy in the past year or two, and who is getting blamed for it, uh, you know, it's, it's even a question of whether any of us would want to be associated with each other. So many slings and arrows have been directed at MBAs at professional management, and a gathering like this, the cream of the Yale School of Management, takes on the aspect of a dark conspiracy to most people if they thought <laughs> that you all were gathering here. And you haven't quite gone out into business, but as you do, you'll, you'll be uh, suspected of many things as time goes on. And I think really the only thing we have going for us, given this, uh, the kind of questions raised about MBAs, is that at least we're not Harvard MBAs. <laughs> <clears throat> so I asked Sharon when I realized I had to give a lecture, all right, so what should I talk about? And she said, well, 
people like to hear about you know, how you got to be doing what you're doing, what you learned along the way, and I thought, well, that's great, it's perfect. It's just like Hollywood, where most conversations end with one mogul saying to the other, you know, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? <laughs> it's actually how it works out there. So, but I did not want to fall in the stereotype of the self-involved mogul who's always talking or thinking about himself. And actually, I admit, it's not due to modesty. It's basically because most of those people are getting fired now. So I'm distancing myself <laughs> from that. Um, so shit, we agreed that in the current economic crisis, it, we need a treatise on corporate leadership. So uh, here we go. And people, as I said at the beginning, have grown weary of MBAs. You know, are they good? Are they bad? Are they part of the problem? Or are they part of the solution? And if they're not part of the solution, how much do we have to pay them to go away? The MBA. <clears throat> but of course, in, in this room, we know that all it takes to solve the world's problem is an MBA, which you all have. So before I pontificate on the nature of the problem and what the solution is to the global financial crisis. I think I ought to talk to you about some things I know something about. So, you know, as the, as the joke goes, let's talk about me. So when I came out of Stanford, I looked around at the other graduates, and they were going into high competitive consulting firms, the cream of Wall Street investment banking, Silicon Valley advanced engineering firms, and I said, Jeff, go into an industry where no one can add. But this would give me <laughs> an advantage. <clears throat> so I went into the television business, and you know, they can't. And so this was back in the late 70s, early 80s, when uh, things were changing very, very fast for the big broadcast networks. Um, as Sharon said, in terms of dating oneself, um, you didn't grow up in a country or an era, um, unless you're in Western Europe, that was dominated by several broadcast networks, but I did. And so in those days, um, you basically had three big networks, they had 30% of the audience, and the moguls that ran them were used to just giving orders without much discussion. The layman's term for this is screaming. <laughs> and since they didn't really want to hear any questions or debate about what they were doing, because it was a pretty good life that they had, uh, basically, as the world changed, they couldn't adapt. So when the meteors of change struck the old broadcast media business, they went extinct. And uh, there was huge disruption. And as a young MBA, I landed at HBO. And I was there. And we had an expression back in the late 70s, early 80s, that HBO was cable before cable was cool. Now, cable, may I, it's still cool to me. I don't know if it's cool to you. But we knew, we knew when we were doing this that we didn't know anything. We didn't have much to lose. So basically, we, we tried everything. We argued day and night. And whatever we did that worked, we just kept. So we had, which I think is similar to what's going on in the internet world today, um, you know, a huge appetite for innovation, trial and error. And we went off and uh, just did things, and we figured out later whether they were good ideas or not. We argued incessantly. So I grew up in a culture of debate and argument, um, which I will come back to. I think it's very good. But the one thing we did have, and this is now HBO, and how it ended up being so successful, and 30 years later, it's still as successful as it was then. We had a mission. We had a very clear statement of what we were trying to be which is distinct from a strategy. It was a mission. And I hope you, it, it's recognizable to you. It's TV worth paying for. You know, it's not TV. It's HBO. Every other network in the world at that time was in a business of selling an audience to an advertiser. We were in the business, quite different, of selling a program lineup to an audience. Not show by show, but the whole lineup. 
That made all the difference because it shaped everything we did. It shaped the business model. It changed the decision rules on creating the programming. And so all of the manifestations that people could now mistake for being the key to an HBO, call it Sopranos or Sex and the City or Entourage or the Pacific right now, those are really manifestations of this difference of the whole objective of the organization is different than the one at ABC or MTV or these other networks. Um, so as that mission difference, remember what you're trying to do and who you are, rolled through the era of the next decades, not just the program, but the innovations and the fundamental kind of uh, layers of brick that made up now the television and pretty soon the internet video business got laid and they got laid by HBO. So HBO invented pay television. It invented satellite delivery of TV. It invented and was the first 24 hour network. It was the first network to digitally broadcast instead of analog. It was the first network to encrypt and it was the first network to put on multiplex feed. So it's not just one HBO feed, there are 10. And then it was the first network to take the whole programming lineup, put it on demand. And that last one, uh, which we should not gloss over, is the most important question and action going on right now in the internet business. Because if you say YouTube, Hulu, Apple TV, all of them are attempts to put TV on demand. Uh, that's basically what they are, and I'm going to leave it for questions because I think there are some very interesting questions that come out of that. So uh, things went so well, unfortunately, that at HBO, that when the huge debacle of the Time Warner merger occurred, it was like one of those bad westerns where everyone has a gun on each other under the table, and that's actually what was going on. And by the time they got done shooting, they had all killed each other, and the only people, the, I was basically the only one left. <laughs> so, <clears throat> unfortunately, at the time, because this was 2002, in the wake of this mess, where Time Warner AOL went from being worth 260 billion to 40, it was like, you know, 1939, where they come to your office and say, well, it's going down, it's going under, we're under government investigation, and we'd like you now to run the company. At the time, and I'm not just saying this, I actually was at least half unqualified to doing it. I knew how to run HBO. I didn't really know how to deal with the investors, the board of directors, and all of what has now become such a delightful part of my <laughs> day. <clears throat> and just to give a little feel for what I'm insinuating there, Time Warner, as the name suggests, it came about through a series of mergers. Time Inc. begat HBO. It grew up as part of Time Inc. Uh, then that merged with Warner Brothers to begat Time Warner which then merged with AOL to begat AOL Time Warner, which then degat back to just Time Warner in a giant mess. And yeah, I know, we had some missteps along the way. And in the media business, that's industry jargon for falling off a cliff into a smoking crater, is a, is a miss. We call that a misstep. Uh, we were just like Cisco growing through acquisition, except for our deals really sucked, and we never, <laughs> we never integrated any of them. Other than that, <clears throat> it was the same strategy. <laughs> but the soul of our company, the good part, was the innovation. And actually, we have a lot to brag or boast about. Let me, let me do that. You know, it's fun for me. I gotta get something out of this. So, <clears throat> Time Inc. was the first magazine invented and launched in 1923. Warner Brothers made the first talking motion picture with sound, when everybody thought, well, why do you need sound? CNN was the first 24-hour news network and is now also the leading 
online source of electric, electronic news in the world. AOL was the first big online service and invented social networking, which unfortunately it didn't keep. That's another interesting question. It's a great business. Facebook has it. Um, so that's a lot of innovation across every one of our businesses today. Network, studio, magazines, et cetera. We were the lead innovator. We invented the field of competition. And we are now the leader in share, earnings, et cetera, in every one of those. So that's the good part. But where do we go now? Because as we all know, the media model, the question of are people going to use media the way that they used to? Are they going to use these forms and these brands is very much in question. And then the next question, even if they use all this media, if they use People magazine, if they still watch HBO, if they still like Harry Potter movies, they'll use them. Are they going to pay for them? Or another way to ask it, Maybe they won't pay for them. Maybe we'll be supported through another business model. Are we going to get paid? Is the monetization going to be as uh, viable, I think is the word, as what it was when these forms were invented that gave us our lead? And then a question which I think we'll deal with in Professor Sonnenfeld's class today, is a share lead, which used to be the primary or early, the first determinant of viability and success. Is it as sustainable or important as it used to be, given some of the disruptive technologies that are coming? So uh, all this is to say that in the 30, uh, 30, let's keep it to 30, years since I left Stanford Business School, a lot has changed. And the media business, particularly, being so close to the internet, has had probably as much change as any business has. And so with all that and the catbird seat I was in, did I learn anything throughout all this process? And I, yes, I did. I learned two things. Uh, one, <clears throat> EQ equals IQ. EQ, emotional intelligence, uh, intellectual intelligence. Now, I don't mean they're the same. I just mean that they are probably equally important. And uh, as we get into that subject, most of the train wrecks that I've seen, and let's, uh, well, in the media business or generally in other industries, have come about more from a fascinating lapse of EQ or social relations more so than they have come about due to a failure of analytic intelligence. Um, for example, there's plenty of um, analysis if you go back and pull it. In fact, there was near unanimity that the Time Warner AOL merger was a brilliant, transformative thing. And if you want to prove it, because you can go pull it and read it, the government was besieged with complaints from all our competitors, Disney, News Corp, et cetera, who were convinced that this merger would hurt them. And the government put in a lot of rules, because not only the competition, but the government thought that this would give us a huge advantage. So not only did we have a badly conceived merger that then became badly executed, we, have, we had regulatory disadvantages specifically for us because the consensus view that it was so brilliant analytically, uh, what was what everybody thought. None of that turned out to be true. Um, the same thing if you don't just use um, the AOL Time Warner merger, but look at the financial industry. There was a clearly impressive edifice of analysis and sophisticated quantitative proof developed for why the most recent innovations in complexity and risk spreading in the financial system was a, you know, we were in a new era of advanced development. And I think, as you all know, if you sit in your seats, your classmates and your immediate predecessors, who were very high uh, functioning graduates of this business school and many others, went into finance and were part of building that whole 
system. So it was really an A plus academic effort right before the whole thing collapsed and crashed. And so uh, what the heck is going on here? I mean, how did all this brilliant thinking go so badly? And it's, you know, with hindsight now, we can see the fault lines underneath the AOL Time Warner merger, and we can talk about them after this. We can all now see, and it's on the edit pages every day, the fault lines underneath the financial system that is you now, you've now, now got congressional committees reviewing key participants, including Greenspan yesterday in the financial crisis, kind of saying, well, look at all these facts now with hindsight that clearly showed we were heading to a problem. Why didn't you, the, reg the regulate, the F why didn't you, the, uh, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve see it? Why didn't you, when it's the bank CEO panel, see it? And nobody s seems to have seen it. And uh, now it's received wisdom that it wasn't good. And it's kind of like, the questions go along the lines of, since you knew it wasn't good, why did you do it? Well, that's not how it looked at the time. So uh, you could argue in that set of subjects, whether it's AOL or uh, the finance uh, breakdown, that these were analytic failures. And that's kind of how the discussion goes. Um, but, after it can, so on the question, was it an analytic failure, so not an EQ and IQ failure? If you basically assigned any first year class at SOM or at Stanford um, the hypothetical economy, a case of an economy where 40% of the earnings in the economy came from the financing sector, I think the class would come back from an analytic point of view and just say, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, the function of finance in a total economy isn't 40% of value creation, and so that's not going to last. And if you gave them a case about the merger of two large companies, not startups, large companies, each of which had a market cap over $100 billion, and you proposed an acquisition of one by the other for stock, where the stock was valued at 100 times earnings. You would say, you know, what do you think? The class, I'm pretty sure, would look at the, in, in the case discussion, would say, well, is this a trick question? There's no way that a $100 billion company has 100 times uh, multiple. I mean, you know, you know the growth rate you have to have, and you can't do that off a base that big. So it doesn't make any sense. Well, the fact is, both of those things happened. The finance system was such a high profit in, in finance and the AOL Time Warner merger. And, you know, I'm saying it. If you had looked at it kind of fresh eyes, you, wouldn't, you would be very concerned about it. But the fact that these things happened in the real world says something about how people behave in groups, despite the analytic, fairly obvious analytic questions that arise when you state it the way I'm stating it now. So it brings me to the second thing I learned kind of close to the first, which is that culture trumps strategy. And I'll say it, let's say, in a company, and I apologize for using the word trump in a room full of MBAs. <laughs> but I put it this way, if you have a good strategy, and a bad culture, a one that's not uh, dynamic and self-questioning, you will eventually miss some major change that needs to happen because you're riding on a thing that may work for the time being, but you ca it can't adjust. I think it's true of countries. I think it's true of companies. Um, if you have a healthy culture where people can keep asking each other, what is our mission again? Why are we doing? it this way? Is it still the thing that we provide as a value? Are there parts of what we do in the value chain that are better now done by someone else as the world changes? You can always figure out the right strategy as the seasons change if you have a culture and a process that keeps looking for it. Uh, 
War no lecture at a class would be complete without quotes from Warren Buffett, who likes to say, in looking for people to hire, you look for three things, integrity, intelligence, and energy. And if they don't have the first one, the next two will kill you. It's really true. Think, think about a person of high energy and intelligence with no integrity working for you. Um, I've had those. <laughs> That's a treat. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know, because you want to be fair to them. That's not how they feel. <laughs> so, so I remember back at Stanford, we used to debate a lot, because Stanford's a pretty good analytics school in finance, economics, accounting, which is great about it. And we had requirements in organizational behavior, which basically the high-end, quantitatively gifted and accomplished students in quant would basically look askance at the, the softer, more debatable skills or questions raised in uh, psychology, organizational behavior. Um, you know, understandable, but over the years, I've seen a lot of uh, what I would call psychological and social problems, either among, inside an individual or in a team organization vastly outweigh analytic and quantitative competence. I mean, the problem as you get to the top isn't a lack of capability and competence. It's, a, it's the fact that people go insane is basically what happens. Um, if you look at the founding fathers and how they wrote the American checks and balances, that's basically what they were saying. If you put too much power in somebody's hands and there's no countervailing power, you're going to end up with a problem. And corporations are not democracies, so you do have that issue. I'll leave for the question period whether boards are relevant to the restraint or uh, balance in that question, because it's not clear how often that they are. So um, I'm basically not saying that mushy and, and so forth, you know, mushy is not better than tough and smart. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just pointing out that given the pressure in business, given the pressure that people have to be decisive and to convey, you know, competence and clarity, that sometimes saying, I don't know, let's go through this again, I'm not so sure this is right, is the thing that's being tough and smart, rather than this reach for the lever, I'm decisive, let's do it. Uh, it's, and you gotta be able to do both. So uh, how to know which is which. You hear a lot about teamwork and leadership. Casey Stengel, who knew a lot about winning, used to say, finding good players is easy, but getting them to play as a team, that's a different story. Of course, he also said, if we're gonna win the pennant, We've got to st stop thinking that we're not as good as we think we are. It takes a minute to figure that out. <clears throat> uh, then there's a leadership thing. Many people assume that leadership comes from the top. Yeah, you know, yes and no. Sometimes yes. Here's what Harry Truman had to say about being president. I sit here all day trying to persuade people to do the things that they ought to have sense to do without me persuading them. Now, I, that registers with me. That's exactly how I would describe my day. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So no matter who you are, what you want to do, what the size, unless you're working by yourself, of your organization is, you're going to need help to do every, really, everything that you do every day. And if you're the CEO of a fairly large company, you're going to need more help than anybody else because you're supposed to be the one who's organizing everybody and telling them what to do. Uh, most of the time, you find that out from them. You don't figure out what the problems are, shape them, and then what the alternative answers might be. Those things are always shaped by your colleagues. So the question is, how do you create an organization and a set of relationships where your people can go out and keep finding the question, keep bringing it in, shaping it in a way where it's eligible for decision and consideration, a, a, a culture and a tone where all the different options, including some risky ones, can be, figured, can be debated. And then when you're choosing 
which the answers, what answers there are, how to shape the answer in a way that they can execute. Because you know, these are not classroom exercises. These are things that have even the best organized decision isn't really mapped out. It's a direction. It's not a plan. And when you make a plan, as one, I mean, we've got, at one, we had 100,000 people, now we have 50,000. There's no plan we make that is even half recognizable once it's going of what it was originally conceived as. So everything that you're doing is fluid most of the time. Um, so really what you need, you need to make sure you're getting an honest view. You need to make sure that people calling in and saying, I think there's a problem or I think the latest decision that you made might be wrong. Now people don't like to do that. If you've set up a fairly hierarchical power structure, nobody wants to come in and tell their department boss or God forbid the big boss that he or she is wrong. Um, you can't look at it that way, it's not wrong, it's just no longer the best idea. <clears throat> so I've always been puzzled in that whole dynamic by smart, ambitious people that are, they spend their entire career doing something called managing up, where they don't, they're trying to figure out what does the up want to hear and how to tell it to them, and they're essentially currying favor as they go up and they're elbowing aside or ignoring everyone next to them on their way up. So the one skill, let's say that this works for them, and so where do they end up? The one skill that they've practiced is useless once they get where they want to go. So now they're at the top, they never manage side or down, they don't know how to do it, they don't even like it. I don't know why they want to do that in the first place. So you don't have to be Gandhi. I'm not saying you have to be you know, self-sacrificing. But at the very least, as Casey Stengel said again, a successful leader has to be able to keep the people who really hate him away from the undecideds. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, finally, you have to be able to take risks. You know, admit it, you don't really, you're not really sure what you want to do. That's one, an ongoing problem. And even if you have a vague idea what, what you want to do, I hope you know, and you probably do, that you probably don't really know how to do it, whatever it is that you think you want to do. <laughs> so I certainly felt that way. Maybe it's more about me. Um, so coming out of business school, I had some trouble figuring out what to do. I turned down jobs in consulting, investment banking, TV ad sales, Winery management, that was a hard one. <laughs> and I took a job in commercial banking, which even in those days at Stanford was probably the least respected area you could do. I had a lot of friends saying, why would you go to commercial banking? Um, and partly it was because I couldn't decide among those other jobs. But partly it was because I thought Citibank would be a good general grounding in analysis. And there was also an exotic twist due to my indecisiveness at the time, which is I was going to go into international banking. I had worked in Paris as a, as a teenager, and I was going to go to Hong Kong. Um, and I was going to be in the shipping department, which uh, if you, not, not the shipping of boxes, but the lending money to tankers and ships. So I thought, well, this is exotic, you know? I'm gonna be in Asia, part of the, you know, all that, I'm gonna learn finance and accounting, it's gonna be great. And so as I went off to become this brilliant banker, um, I learned, again, that it's not all about MBA tools and analysis. And so one little story about me going like this was the Onassis group, Aristotle Onassis, he, maybe you guys don't remember, but in our ages, he was married to Jackie Kennedy, and he lived a, a great life. One of the, the statements he was famous for was to say, the only revenge is to live well. So for a young MBA, you know, this is, this is a guy to emulate. Anyway, he had died. And one day in my office in New York for Citibank, 
and I was there wearing my suit, so I thought I was all prepared for banking work. I got a frantic call from Christina Onassis, the, the daughter of Ari. And with Aristotle had just died, and she had taken over the entire company. She wasn't sure how to do it. She was calling from Athens, and she was really upset. This was 1977. Uh, and there was a lot of Cold War tension. There was the Pershing missiles going in in East Germany, and a lot of, you know, West Germany, a lot of Cold War tension. And she had become convinced that the Soviets were going to march into Athens. And so she wanted me to ship, this is lunchtime, $25 million of gold bullion that the Onassis family had in Athens out of the vault in the basement of the Athens Bank and get it out of the country to New York before the Soviets could get it. Today, she said, and now it's lunch here, it's 8 p.m. there. She says, you know, call me back. So this was not the kind of problem I was used to. <laughs> and and it was lunchtime. So my boss it was over at the Brook Club having lunch, and his boss was at the racket club playing squash. And she was saying, call me back in a half an hour. So I was in a panic. And I had nowhere else to go, so I headed to the back office where the overlooked and underpaid clerical staff hung out. That's where they were. And there was a Mrs. Kalamanopoulos there who had clearly, as I looked at her, seen her share of clueless young MBAs in a suit before. So I told her my problem and how do we arrange trucking and shipping and security for this. And she kind of looked at me with a patient smile. And she said, Jeff, you don't ship the gold from Athens. You sell it in Athens. You buy it in New York. She picks up the phone. And 30 seconds later, it's done. She's looks at me, you know, in a, in a very <laughs> friendly way. <clears throat> and so I was saved from my first giant failure, which with our biggest client, for, by this woman, who I hadn't really spent much time with before. So I give it as a bit of an object lesson. You never really know who's going to help you or whether they're going to help you. And they'll decide, not you. So um, I think one of my messages, all of us are constantly trying to convey to others, even now at my age, that we know what we're doing. And uh, there's a saying in Hollywood that, that captures this, and it's a saying about why a movie that has just come out is a huge hit. The saying also applies if a flop comes out. And the saying is, quote, nobody knows anything. Um, that's a Hollywood saying. There's another one that actually says, everybody knows everything. And either one of those is used to excuse almost any success or failure. It certainly applies to one of my big gambles. You know, I get a lot of credit now, uh, and deservedly, you know, of course, <laughs> <laughs> for The Sopranos, which was a huge hit at HBO, which if, you know, we were smart, we would say, yep, we knew it all along. Uh, no, we didn't. So I remember it like yesterday, how this whole thing started. It, meeting the man who created The Sopranos, David Chase, whose real name is David DiCesare. And I walked out on my driveway on a Sunday morning to get the newspaper. And this guy steps out of a late model sedan. He told me I had an idea for a TV show. He wanted to come in my house and give me the idea. Well, I was reluctant. I asked him. <laughs> I asked him uh, who he was and you know, where he came from, and he said, never mind. Then he said something that I will never forget. He said it would be in my personal best interest <laughs> to green light this show, put it on the air. And he had really done his homework. He showed me that he cared about what was important to me. He, he, <laughs> He knew the names of all my kids <laughs> and where they went to school. <clears throat> so I invited him in, and we did the show. <clears throat> and the rest is history. So that concludes the lecture. <laughs> and what I hope that what, we've, what I've tried to do is give you a little insight into both industry structural change and also uh, 
the kind of balance between you know, analytic understanding and basically, as I was saying, Sharon and I were talking about this before we came over, the quote unquote leadership skills, which frankly most of the people, in whether they're running departments or companies, they have, there's a little bit of a uh, shrinking away from the concept of leadership if, what, if it is thought to mean that it has something to do with position. Because if you're, uh, you actually have to lead all the way along. You can lead from the lowest position, you can lead from the highest position. You have to be as willing to follow as to lead. And boy, you know, for me, if the, the decisions I get every day, re really the only ones I get are the ones that are really screwed up. I mean, there's no other reason they get to me. They come to me when there's two, three, or four competing views or competing interests that have this mess that they either can't figure out or they don't want to compromise. And so they come to a, a source of authority to either make a decision or bless a compromise. And as I said in the talk, you're sitting, you don't even know what the question is before they get there, and you find out what the competing teams are when they're describing it. And usually, more than half the time, the answer emerges from the interplay of the stated interests and reasons. Um, half the time when I'm done, I kind of look at the people that have brought these judgments to me and say to them, you know, you could do this without me. It's not me that figured out the answer. I was just sitting here asking you questions. It, it basically ends up in the interchange. Occasionally, and these are the big ones, and it's true of every level, the questions that ba basically nobody knows the answer to that somebody has to judge and then take responsibility for clearly are the ones that are the riskiest, the most unknown, and they will you know, you'll have them at every stage from the beginning of your career to the end. And uh, you're not going to get them all right. So since you know that some of these giant decisions you're going to make are going to be wrong, you just don't know which ones, you need to have the understanding of your people that you're working with. All right, when we made that decision, here's why we did it. Here were the assumptions. And let's not get too invested or make any of these personal, because then we can't fix them when they turn out to be wrong. So I leave with that thought. I hope it brings questions uh, for this group.